with us today. You, um, Dennis, during this uh, recital of, uh, of Sello's about that yeah. Ravonia speech, I know we spoke a little bit about it, but we only spoke about that line about uh, an ideal for which I'm willing yeah. to die. Um, how did you feel when you were listening? Because you were saying that, that the overall tone and the theme in which Mandela spoke was, was completely... It, it was calm in a way, but, but still authoritative. What was it like? You know, the speech really... He traced his own life as a kid in the countryside in the Transkei, why he wanted to go beyond to the big city, his horror at what he discovered on the mines, why he had to get politically engaged, why he felt we had to undertake an armed struggle to add to the politics, and why he had to lead it. And one of the things he said was that as a young person in the royal household growing up, he, he was impressed with this oral history of the resistance to the conquest. It took the British a hundred years to conquer. And he wished to emulate the heroes of the South African people and their resistance. Yeah. That's where it comes from. And he said it out very clearly. And at the end he said, really what African people want is a a share, an equal share in our country, uh, with equal and full rights for everybody. It's carrying through the ideas of the Freedom Charter and so on. And then came this peroration of his ideal of a free and democratic society with no racism in effect. And when he came to the line that he hoped to live to s realize this ideal, you know, we were on trial for our lives. Yeah. But if needs be, he said, it was an ideal for which he was prepared to die. And it wasn't shouted, hang me if you dare. It was very calm, very stressful voice, if you listen to the actual recording. But it was such a clear challenge. Hang all of us, he was saying. Yeah. But we're going to be free one day. That was implicit in that. In, in whatever he was yes. saying. Yeah. There, was no, there was no great histrionics. There was no... I couldn't hear the way it was read now, yeah, yeah. but I've heard it in other films and so on, and it gets distorted and takes away from the gravity of his style yeah. and his determination. And that was so impressive, you know. Yeah. You know, that, that remaining speech, Cathy, I'm going to speak a little bit louder because I know you, you're struggling to hear me, but that particular speech, the speech from the dock, um, that was the only evidence that we had of Mandela for the entire time and the duration that he was in prison. That was all we had, almost, of, of all of you. Um, you just disappeared behind, behind these jail cells. We, we didn't know what was going on. We weren't allowed to know what was going on. So that speech was one of the most important speeches ever given um, when it came to the struggle movement and during that Ravonia trial. How significant is it now, listening back and hearing <laughs> what was said during that speech? No, it's as significant as it, as it was at that time. Particularly to reach out to the young people. Unfortunately, one has to admit the young people are very ignorant of what happened. Yeah. And uh, there's also uh, all sorts of ideas that they have. And this speech is one of the speeches that needs to be spread to the young people. Uh, the message that, uh, that uh, has to be conveyed, freedom did not fall from heaven. Freedom was fought for at great cost. And Madiba's uh, speech was uh, indicative of the courage with which the leadership and, and the followers faced that situation uh, facing us. And of course then fast forward to June 76, his Soweto, you know, another great milestone in our struggle, a turning point in our struggle. Yeah, yeah. You, <coughs> you talk about the youth, and, and in a way, I almost feel that you feel a little bit let down. And, 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 and I say that with all respect, just in terms of, do you, do you think that the youth of today appreciate 
what happened 50 years ago, the struggle that was fought for them to be living the life that they're living now. As I said, one of the biggest challenge facing us today is ignorance. Yeah. Uh, particularly among young people. Of course, one wants them to take the fullest advantage of what democracy has brought for them. But at the same time, for them to remember that uh, with freedom comes responsibility. The majority of population in this country is young. Yeah. And our country is in need of skills in every direction. So we need, we need to reach a situation where we don't have to import skills. As the Freedom Charter says, the doors of learning are now open. Yeah. In every direction, the universities provide, provide that. And we like to encourage the young people to take advantage of that uh, and, uh, so that they can serve the country better. Yeah, and, and, and certainly that way. Dennis, I'm, I'm going to bring you into the conversation as well. We look at, we've, we're celebrating 20 years of democracy. We had our general elections now, and this election was dubbed the born free elections. And yet, when you look at the amount of youth that actually went to the polls, it was a dismal figure. Um, the youth are not actively participating in this freedom that was so so immensely fought for by gentlemen like yourselves. Uh, your, your views on, on the youth and where we're standing right now with them. Well, I keep meeting young people who say to me, thank you to your generation that we can go to university, we can qualify. Maybe it's a small <coughs> proportion, but there is an awareness and I'm surprised. Taxi drivers recognize me. I'm not famous like Madiba or Cathy or Mlangeni. But it's, it's, it, it's refreshing, can I say that people are aware. But this is Youth Month as well, June. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Kathy mentioned the uprising, the student uprising, all over the country after Soweto. And so youth have played an important role, and I think youth will continue to play a role. One of the things we need to stress, and Kathrada's foundation does it, is that we were a non-racial group, a multi-racial group of activists, fighting for a non-racial South Africa. And this ideal for which Nelson Mandela and all of us were prepared to die is something we have to defend all the time now because it's easy to lose sight of it. Yeah. I know who the most deprived are. I know all of that. But there is the need to uphold the non-racism of our constitution. And this is where I think the young people need to go to the Robben Island Museum. Yeah this place, as Kathrada said, the triumph of the human spirit. Need to go to the Apartheid Museum to know what it was like. Need to go to the Lilies Leaf Museum. It was another part of the struggle of a group of people who were trying to find a way to bring the freedom. Yeah. All of these complement this history, not one alone. And that's where the education must be. And I would love to see our basic education department making a concerted effort to take young people Agreed. to all of these museums in groups. But it takes a budget. It needs treasury to finance it. It needs a government decision because history is important. Yeah, it is. It is. It's <coughs> it stirs emotions. It awakens your mind. And you realize, my goodness, this is, this is why I'm here. And this is why I'm free. But Nelson Mandela says, the last page of his autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, yeah. in his lifetime, Having climbed a mountain, a mountain range, he realizes there's always another mountain to climb. Yes. We've climbed one mountain to get to democracy. Absolutely. The young people have got to climb another mountain range and another one and another one until we achieve our freedom. <laughs> until we get there. Let me just wrap this up. And, and, and Kathy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the final word with you. Uh, tonight you are doing something uh, to commemorate this, this occasion of 50 years for the Ahmed Katrada Foundation. It's also the very first time in 50 years that Madiba is not here. Um, he's not one of the, the, the Ravonia trialists that's still, that's still alive, that's still here to talk about and remember that occasion. The memories are left with the three of you now. Um, how does that feel? Well, it is a, a vacuum that cannot be filled. 
and we can't do it artificially. But there are so many things that we can do to recall his life uh, in various ways. Just to give you an example, yesterday I was out in Bethel and uh, there was a little girl who had come to Robben Island. It was her, she had made two requests, she was terminally ill. Yeah. One was to go to Robben Island, the second was to meet President Mandela. Uh, when we put it to Madiba about this girl, and uh, we said, uh, you know, they lived out in Secunda. Uh, we said, we should, uh, you know, we want to bring the girl to meet you. Because that was a terminal wish. He said, no, that's too much trouble for the child. We must go there. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. And he went there. So yesterday I went out to Bethel to the parents of this girl and to her grave, you know. And they can never ever regret, uh, rem uh, forget the impact that Madiba's presence made. And they showed us a video of the hundreds and thousands of people who just gathered uh, at their house That's when amazing. Madiba went to see this child. That's incredible, mm. incredible story, and a beautiful story to leave this interview, this, this very special interview. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us. Uh, Kathy, it's an honor. Dennis, it's always an honor. And uh, I wish you all the best today and going forward, and, and let's celebrate many, many more years to come thank of you. that, that momentous occasion. Thank you so much. Dennis Goldberg, Ahmed Katrada, joining us live from the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory here in Houghton. Let's go back to the uh, Auckland Park studios now to get you some headlines.